Well, good evening for this Monday night of Refresh Online. We're gonna have two incredible speakers, Mark Bearden and Bill Ellip. At seven o'clock this hour, Mark Bearden is going to be speaking on desperate praying from Matthew chapter 11. These are desperate times. We need to know how to bombard heaven with our prayers. Mark is one of the great prayer leaders in America, and I hope that you'll listen in, take notes, and learn more about how you can cry out to God in this hour. At eight o'clock, Bill Eliff, who has been a frequent guest speaker at Refresh and at Sherwood, is going to be speaking out of the book of Romans on victory over sin. Isolation, separation, social distancing does not mean we are removed from temptation. It does not mean we are removed from the desire to sin, but how do we overcome sin? Bill's going to talk about that in the eight o'clock hour. So I hope that you'll join us tonight, this first Monday night of Refresh Online with Mark Bearden and Bill Ellis. You know, I was thinking as I was sitting there, I'm, I wanna share a story with you real quickly. Last night, Mark did that series of songs on the name of Jesus. And uh, then as we were just singing, Jesus never fails. This week, Tom and I were talking about a missionary named Helen Rosevere, and uh, she shared this story. She was a doctor in uh, Central Africa, and she shared about early one morning taking a, a couple of missionaries driving several hours from their mission station from the hospital to an airport. She had dropped them off for a flight back to, this, uh, to their home. She was returning back in the early morning hours, and she said she just became overwhelmed, overcome with sleepiness. And she said she tried repeatedly to shake it off, and she did all the tricks. She just couldn't do it. And so it was kind of a barren landscape. And up ahead, there was one giant bush along this dirt road. And she thought to herself, I'm going to pull off in the early morning sun behind that bush, and I'm just going to sleep a while and, you know, get, get things back together. And she said she pulled off, and she kind of leaned back to close her eyes. And she said immediately uh, a man stepped out from behind that bush. And she was kind of shocked to see anybody out there. And he greeted her, and she greeted him, and then he just stood there, and uh, she said, can I help you? And he said, are you a sent one? And she said, she thought to herself, well, it depends, sent by whom for what? And, and uh, she said, what do you mean? And he said this, he said, are you a sent one from the great God to tell me about Jesus? She said, that's a little bit shocking anywhere in the world, and said that she could tell by the way he said the name Jesus in his language that he didn't know if Jesus was a he, she, or an it. And uh, she said, why do you ask that? And he said, well, I'm just a simple herdsman. And he said, last week, my brother who works at the school came home early in the middle of the afternoon, and I asked him why he was home. And he said, he's a very wicked man. And he said, all oh, some, some people came from another country and said they had been sent from the great God to tell us about Jesus. And he had asked him, well, what'd they say? And he said, well, I don't know. I left. I didn't stay. And this is what he said. He said, over the days as I, I worked out in the fields there, he said, that name Jesus was sweet to my thoughts. And he said, I finally prayed, God, if there is a God, would you bring me a sent one to tell me of Jesus? And out there on that roadside, Helen Rosevere led that tribesman to Christ. And I love that statement. There is something sweet about the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, let me say one more thing as we enter into the word here. There are so many thank yous I could give, but I, I just want to publicly take a moment and just, she's not here, but thank my wife, Amy. Uh, she is home with our five children. I am what I am because of her love and her faithfulness and her love for God. And I have, I can say the biggest uh, boast I can make about my wife is uh, I have never wondered in 20 years about her passion for Christ. It has never wavered, and it is the greatest blessing on this earth that God has given me. She is the greatest blessing. And so I just want to take a moment to publicly thank her. And even though she won't know it, but I want you to know that I'm here because of that. Turn in your Bibles. We're going to look at one verse in Matthew chapter 11. And then a little bit more in Acts chapter 27. I, I want to talk again about the subject of prayer. And, you know, in the passage that Tom read from uh, a couple of nights ago in Ephesians 6, in verse 18, when you put on the armor, uh, 
Paul then says, you put on the armor, as Tom said, for the purpose of prayer. And he says, praying always. And then he says, with all prayer. And literally that means all kinds of prayer. And, uh, and then praying in the Spirit. And, and prayer takes many forms. And, and often, depending on the, the stage of life you're in, the season, even, even the trials, the different things you're going through, through prayer looks differently. There's all kinds of praying. I mean, there's, there's just sometimes when all you can get in is a word. There are times where a grief grabs your heart so deeply that, that you don't even have words. There are moments when you get on your knees and it just seems to flow and, and prayer just comes so naturally. Sometimes prayer seems labored and, and, and you struggle. And let me just give you an encouragement in that area. M- much of, of our prayer life is what someone has called the marching orders of life. There is a discipline to it. Uh, I like what Evan Roberts, who God used in the Welsh Revival, said, sometimes you go to the Word because you're hungry. Sometimes you go there to get hungry. And, and there is a discipline at times involved in that and, and just being faithful in prayer. And, and, and sometimes it can be a battle. And I have many Christians come up to me and say, you know, my, I, I'm just so frustrated in my prayer life. And, and I don't know about you, but one of my greatest battles in prayer is where my mind wants to go. Anybody relate to that? I, I tell you, I, I tell you, for me, one of my biggest battles is my to-do list. I can get down on my knees and right away my mind starts going to all the things I've got to accomplish today. And, uh, you know, pray out loud. Nothing says you have to pray silently. Maybe keep an, a pad next to you. Just write, write it down. Go right back to prayer. I remember one morning I was, I was praying. And uh, now remember, I, I lived for most of our married life. We lived in an RV. And uh, right in the middle of my prayer, this thought came to mind. I have got to empty my holding tank today. <laughs> now, if you know anything about RVs, they have sewage. And sewage was simply part of my life for many, many years. And so that's what came to mind right in the middle of my praying. I've got to empty my holding tank. And I thought, you know, I really hate doing that. I thought, you know, I wish it just rained really hard and I could just open it up and let it wash away. And (laughs) I thought, no, you can't do that. That's against the law. And then that reminded me of a news story I'd seen about these ships trying to figure out what to do with their sewage. I started thinking about that, and then that reminded me of another news story I'd seen about these ships trying to figure out what to do with their garbage. And I thought, you know, they could build compartments under the ship, and they could put all the garbage in one of those compartments. And then that reminded me of the Titanic, because when they built the Titanic, they built it with all these compartments underneath, and because of that, it was never supposed to sink, and the only thing it ever did do was sink on the first trip. And then that reminded me of a story of a lady named Rose McQuarrie, who when she was nine years old, her father took her to put her on an ocean liner to go visit family. As they were approaching the ship, someone had put a sign out that said, not even God could sink this ship. Uh, Her father took her by the hand, turned her around, walked her home, would not let her get on the boat, and that ship was the Titanic. And I thought, God, it is so ridiculous to challenge you like that. And then I thought, how did I get on the Titanic? I mean, one moment I'm praying, and a few moments later, I'm trying to figure out why the Titanic sunk. Uh, I mean, thankfully, I ended up back at God. Usually, I don't. But I I heard a man of God say this one time. I thought it was very profound. Someone once asked an artist, what are your two greatest hindrances to creativity? I think about this. He said, what are your two greatest hindrances to creativity? This was his answer. Number one, interruptions. Number two, the fear of interruption. And I found those are the greatest hindrances to my prayer life. Interruption and the fear of interruption. That's why scripture says find a prayer closet. A closet can be a closet. A closet can be the woods. A closet can be your car. I I do some of my best praying driving. A closet can be a time span. At this stage of life, my best times will often come in the, the middle of the night when God wakes me. And, and I know I have no fear of interruption at all with my children sleeping. And, and so find a place and, and, and persevere in praying. But what I want to talk to you tonight is a different aspect of prayer. And, and it's what I want to call desperate praying. Now, in, in Matthew chapter 11, there's a verse. And I don't know if you've ever done this, but have you ever read a verse? And after you read it, thought to yourself, 
what in the world does that mean? Now, don't look at me all pious. Amen. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Amen. And, and I've, I've said this verse several times this week. Is the glory of God to conceal a matter? Is the glory of a king to search it out? And, and I remember reading Matthew 11, verse 12, which says this, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. I remember reading that verse and saying, Lord, what in the world does that mean? From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. And I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, would you open that up to me? And I, I began to pray over that. And one morning in my devotional, God just opened up an understanding of that verse. Now, I want you to get in your mind an image of the Old Testament character, Jacob. Now, you remember Jacob's story. Jacob and Esau were twins. Uh, Jacob was a manipulator. He was a deceiver. His very name, in essence, meant deceiver. He was a con artist. Jacob was one of those guys who could work everything out in his favor. You ever met somebody like that? I, I mean, he, he, he conned his brother, stole a, a blessing, that, or conned his brother of a birthright. He deceived his father, stole a blessing that belonged to his brother. He conned his father-in-law. I mean, I mean, Jacob was just one of those smooth operators. And there comes a point in Jacob's life after years of separation from his brother Esau. And you remember Esau's last words to Jacob was, I'm going to kill you, when they're about to be reunited. And as you can imagine, Jacob's probably nervous about this reunion. And the night before they're to encounter each other is when Jacob has that famous wrestling match with the angel. Now, many believe that to be what's called a Christophany, an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ, because afterwards Jacob says, I have seen God face to face. Now, I don't know about you, but I remember seeing a painting of that event, and it showed Jacob and the angel like this with their arms on each other's shoulders. Now, that may make for a good painting, but I want you to remember something. It's nighttime, and in the darkness, someone attacks Jacob. I mean, he doesn't know if it's a thief, a robber, perhaps an assassin, his brother sent over, and he begins to wrestle this person. And, and again, that may make for a good painting, but have you ever really wrestled somebody? Maybe even when you thought your life depended on it? And so they grappled, and I'm sure they rolled, and they were sweaty and filthy, and Jacob was, was exhausted. But, but in those early morning hours... After this intense wrestling match, and again, I'm sure they're, they're just covered, he's covered with dirt and he's sweating, and he's in, in Jacob's heart and mind, he still thinks, I can overcome, I can win. And in the early morning hours, the scripture says that the angel reached and he touched Jacob's hip and dislocated it. Now, I don't know if you've ever stopped to think about this, but you know, the angel could have done that the moment they embraced. The moment they started wrestling, he could have done that. But this is why I believe he waited. Because God wanted to exhaust Jacob's abilities. You see, Jacob's entire life, he could do it. He could work it out. He could, he, he could, deceive, he could con, he could do it. He could always work things out. And in those early morning hours when there's nothing left in the tank, when he's totally exhausted and the angel touches his hip, a light goes on in Jacob's mind and he suddenly realizes, I am not fighting man, I am fighting God. In fact, I, I believe that he didn't just realize it for the moment. I think he realized his whole life had been spent fighting God. Brother Ron Dunn used to always say that the greatest battles of the Christian life won't be with the devil, they'll be with God. And I think at that moment, he suddenly realized, I'm fighting God, and I've been fighting him my whole life. And do you remember what he did next? The Scripture says that he lay hold, and he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. Now that is what Matthew eleven twelve 12 is talking about. The kingdom of heaven suffers or undergoes violence, and the violent take it by force. Now listen, the idea here is not somebody who commands God or dictates to God. The idea here is someone who in a holy desperation lays hold of God and says, God, I have nowhere else to go. I have no other hope but you. If you don't do it, it won't happen. God, I have no other source. I grab hold of you and I hang on because you are my only hope. It is a holy desperation. Now, turn to Acts chapter 27, because I want to illustrate this. I want to talk again about the issue of desperate praying. 
The 27th chapter of Acts, it's a story of Paul's journey to get to Rome. Paul had appealed to Caesar. They had said, we were going to let you go, but you've appealed to Caesar. So he's put on a ship. That ship kind of wanders. It's struggling along. They arrive, on, land on an island. They find an Alexandrian ship. They load it. They start to head. And before they, they go, it's late in the season. It's late September, early October. It says, past the Jewish fast of atonement. And, and so Paul tells them, you know, this is not a good time to go. This is not a good idea. But they ignore him and they go on. And then for the next days, they encounter storms and the ship is battered and it's pushed along and, and beaten down. And I mean, and Luke just gives a blow by blow. I mean, they're, they're throwing tackle overboard and then they're throwing the, what's on the boat overboard. And, and, and you finally, in the desperation, you get to verse 20. In Acts 27, and it says, he says this, Since neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small storm was assailing us, from then on all hope of our being saved was gradually abandoned. So Paul says it just got so bad that that everybody gave up hope. And when they had gone a long time without food, then Paul stood up in their midst and said, Men, you ought to have followed my advice and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this damage and loss. Yet now I urge you to keep up your courage, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. Now, beginning verse 23, what Paul does is he tells them that an angel of the Lord has appeared, and this is what the angel said to me. What's interesting about this is Paul's prayer is not recorded, but by the angel's answers, we know what he prayed. And so what I want to do is just look at the three things the angel said to him, and in, in, through this context or through this, this view of the idea of praying in desperation. So the first thing the angel says to him, verse 23, For this very night an angel of the Lord God who I belong and whom I serve stood before me, verse 24, saying, First of all, do not be afraid. Now here's the first point. Desperate prayer is born out of crisis. Desperate praying, I wish that weren't true, but it simply is. Desperate prayer is born out of crisis. You see, Paul had, and we'll talk about this more in a moment, but Paul had had a promise from God that he would be able to bring the gospel to Rome. And he had longed for that. When he writes to the, Roman church, to the church in Rome, he, he, he says, you know, I, I'm longing to be there with you. And, and God had told him specifically, you will get to Rome. But apparently on this journey, things got so bad, the storm got so bad, it looked so hopeless that Paul began to waver. And anxiety set in. And so he went to God, and the first thing the angel said is, Paul, don't be afraid. Now, this is important to understand. Paul did not go to God like the disciples did in the storm to Jesus and said, carest thou not that we perish? I mean, they were afraid of dying. That wasn't the issue for Paul. The issue was Paul believed that God had given him a promise, and it looked, the circumstances had gotten so dark that he felt like it doesn't appear this is going to happen. So he went to God, and the first thing the angel said was, okay, Paul, Don't be afraid. You see, it's crisis that drives us to him like that. And and, and let me say something. I believe with all my heart, every great prayer in Scripture was born out of crisis. You look at Moses interceding for the people. You look at David's most profound prayers in the book of Psalms. You look at Daniel's prayer in Daniel chapter 9. There's a crisis. You look at the high priestly prayer of Jesus in the gospel of John. as He's about to be off the scene and he's praying for his disciples. The prayer in Gethsemane when he's facing crucifixion and the wrath of God for sin. There is a crisis that drives them to prayer. Now here's the problem. We instinctively try to escape crisis. Amen? Amen. I don't enjoy it. (laughs) I don't enjoy trials and suffering and, and those kinds of things. But I believe what we have to do, you have to learn to see crisis through a different lens, through different eyes. I I was talking to a friend of mine some time ago and he was dealing with with a, a messy situation in his church a situation of sin, and, you know, they're always messy, and it's, it's heartbreaking, and it's draining, and it's, it's, it's frustrating, and you're confronting, and there's not repentance, and all these things were going on. He was, he, he was telling me that it just, he was talking to another f- person, he was just pouring it out, another friend, and, and uh, his friend stopped him and said, you know what, 
you need to understand something. He said, this is not an interruption in your ministry. This is why you minister. (laughs) And that statement has stuck with me because we view crisis as an interruption in our lives. God has ordained it. Because what happens is it drives us with a sense of desperation to pray. In fact, our our most powerful prayers will arise out of those desperate moments. As God drives us, we cry out to Him as we've got nowhere else to look. And and you know what's interesting is that that those times will purify our praying. Now, let, let me say you cannot lay hold of God for selfish ambition. And we'll talk about that in a moment, but you cannot selfishly go to God. And so what God will do is he will create a circumstance, and then in the process of that cry, you begin to cry out to him, and then he begins to shape your prayer. You know, to me, the greatest example of that is Paul when he's praying about the thorn in the flesh. And, and by the way, don't get the idea of a splinter there. The, the word in the Greek is a tent stake, and, and he said it buffeted me, and that word means to pound with the fist. And, and so whatever it was just pounded on Paul and pounded on Paul, and Paul prayed three times, God, take it away in the midst of that crisis. And by the way, have you ever stopped to think that Paul prayed three times against the will of God? And then finally, God purified his praying, and he just said, oh, God, I accept. Give me grace. God said, my grace is sufficient. So this crisis brings a desperation. Now, here's the thing. This is what I found in life. Sometimes the most hurtful, painful crisis that you face are caused by the sins of other people. I mean, we all face moments, I mean, sickness and pressures and different things, but I think some of the most heartbreaking moments are those that are brought on by the sin of others. You know, in in the Old Testament, uh, we're told that because of Saul's sin, that an evil spirit was allowed by God to come upon Saul. And Saul would suffer tremendously from that evil spirit. But you know what we always seem to forget is the other person who would suffer tremendously was David. Because of Saul's sin and the spirit that came upon him, he turned on David. David would spend the next years of his life running for his life, hiding in caves, trying to to survive. But you know what? It was during those years that he wrote many of the Psalms, and it was during those years that God prepared him to be king. So even when we suffer for the sin of others, God's using it. All things work together for good. And listen, that doesn't mean God just picks up a scrap heat and tries to make something that looks like modern art out of it. It means that God weaves everything. It's like a symphony. It works purposely or perfectly to accomplish the purposes of God. So desperate prayer is always born out of crisis. Secondly, The angel said, Paul, do not fear, verse 24. And then he secondly, he said, Paul, you must stand before Caesar. So the first point is desperate prayer is born out of crisis. Secondly, desperate prayer lays hold of a promise, taking heaven by force. You see, Paul went to God in the midst of this crisis, everything going on, he's wavering, and he's doing what he commands us to do. Anxiety had set in, be anxious for nothing, but in everything through prayer. And so Paul, the uncertainty had set in with everything happening, so he went to God. And now listen, this is important. Evidently, when Paul went to God, he pled his case, and Tom talked about this. We go based on what we believe God wants to happen. And Paul went and said, God, you have promised me that this will happen. You have promised me that I will get to Rome. And so on that basis, Paul went to God and said, God, this is your promise. I am asking you based on your promise to spare my life at this moment. And again, it wasn't a fear of dying. It was a desire to fulfill a purpose he believed God had given him. And so the angel comes. He said, Paul, don't be afraid, for you must stand before Caesar. Caesar. 
You see, it was based on a promise of God. And that's what I said a moment ago. You cannot lay hold of God for a selfish ambition. You cannot lay hold of God to get what you want accomplished. You can only lay hold of God to, in faith to see what God has ordained accomplished. Again, that statement that the, the faith can only exist within the sphere of God's will. And so he laid hold and he said, God, this is your promise. You know, I, I'm growing in that area, learning about promises from God and, and how to integrate those in and work those in. And, and as God speaks them to my heart, and I, I remember a number of years ago. Now, again, you have to understand all those years traveling. Uh, our, our last son, Luke, was the first baby we had where we had one doctor all the way through and we knew where he was going to be born. Uh, part of living in Life Action Ministries is you have babies wherever you happen to be. And your prayer is that that's not a rest area <laughs> on the highway. And, and my wife, I mean, she's, again, I'm so blessed. I mean, she would go to different doctors all the way through. And then we, God always seemed to work it out. With our oldest son, our third child, we were in Marietta, Georgia. And we were finishing a, a meeting there. And uh, well, we were about halfway through, and she went to see a doctor. And uh, our plan was we were going to finish our meeting there. We were going to drive back the almost 1,000 miles to Oklahoma. There's a, a godly doctor there who just looked out for us and loved us and would help us with our children. And family was there. And, you know, that was a point of security for my wife. And, and so my plan was finish up the meetings and we'd go back. Well, when he visited this doctor, or she visited this doctor, he said, this baby's coming. You better get ready. Now, we were shocked by that. He said, it's, it's coming any, any day. So we were reeling, okay, what do we do? You know, we, we don't really, we know people in the church. We've just gotten to know them, but we don't have any family here. We've got to find a doctor who will deliver here. We've got, you know, we have no support group. And should we try to get home with my wife, do any moment, you know? And, and well, we finished the meetings and the baby didn't come. So now we're facing the next day, what do we do? Do we just stay here or do we try to get to family? And, and I knew in my heart my wife wanted to be there. And, and, and I just went to the Lord and I went to the Word. And it's interesting, God gave me two verses. One which said this, that Mary gave birth when her days were completed. Now remember, our days are numbered in His book. And that doesn't just mean when we die, it means when we are born. And so God's in charge of that. And so God spoke to my heart, said, I'm in charge of those days. And the second word, verse was in Psalm 29, which says this, it is the voice of the Lord that causes the deers to calf, to give birth. And so I just said, Lord, we're heading for Oklahoma. If you would mind not talking for a couple of days. <laughs> we drove a thousand miles. And you have to understand that truck bounces, you know. We drove a 1,000 miles, got back to Oklahoma. A day and a half later, my wife went into labor. But you know, there are other, one of my favorite stories of revival, Duncan Campbell tells of, in, in the Hebrides Islands, that there was a godly woman in one of the villages who used to call for him periodically, and she would give him direction. And he said he often had no idea why he was doing it. He just trusted her. And one day she sent for him. She said, Mr. Campbell, I want you to go across the island to this particular village. Duncan Campbell said he didn't know anybody there. He'd never been there, but he trusted her. He got on his motorcycle, began to drive across the island. He said as he was riding along, he passed a young girl on the side of the road, and he could tell she was crying. He stopped and got off and went back to her and knelt down on the side of the road and he said, can I help you? And in her Scottish brogue, she said, ah, you cannot help me. Only God can help me. Duncan Campbell said he thought to himself, here's a young lady. The Lord's dealing with her. I'll lead her to Christ. He said, I think I can help you. She said, ah, you cannot help me. Only God can help me. Duncan Campbell said, what's wrong? She said, way over the mountain there somewhere lives a man named Duncan Campbell. She had no idea she was talking to him. And she said, God has told me that he's to come and to preach in my village and that my brother and my uncle will be saved. And he said, how do you know this? This 17-year-old girl, she said, because I spent the whole night in prayer. He said, you spent the whole night praying? She said, I, and the night before that. 
He said, you spent two whole nights praying. She said, you don't understand. My brother and my uncle are lost. They're going to die and go to hell. And God has told me that Duncan Campbell will preach in my village and that they'll be saved. Duncan Campbell said he took her by the shoulders and he shook her gently and he said, look at me. She looked up into his eyes and he said, I'm Duncan Campbell. And he said, I'm not ashamed to say that she threw her arms around my neck and began to sob over and over again, you're a covenant-keeping God, you're a covenant-keeping God. And that night, Duncan Campbell preached in her village, and the first two people down the aisle were her brother and her uncle. But listen to what she said as she threw her arms around him. You're a covenant-keeping God. You see, evidently, she had found a promise from God that she laid hold of. And that's what we lay hold of is God's promises. And then thirdly, I love this. He said, Paul, don't be afraid. You must stand before Caesar, lay hold of a promise. And then thirdly, and behold, God has granted to you all those who are sailing with you. The third point is this. Desperate prayers are always bold prayers. Desperate praying is bold praying. I love this. You know what happened? All this chaos is going on. Paul gets on his face before God. He said, God, you promised me this. It looks hopeless right now, but you promised me. God says, Paul, don't be afraid. I'm going to get you to Rome. You're going to testify there. And evidently, in the midst of that prayer, Paul said, Now, by the way, God, there's 276 men on this ship, and I'd like the life of every one of them. You know what I love? A little later when Luke gives the numbers, he said there's 276, and it doesn't say men, it says souls. And so here is this ship, 276 people, three of them we know were godly men. Luke, Paul, Aristarchus, you had brave men. You had Roman soldiers who knew how to do battle. You had cowardly men. You had some sailors who were ready to sneak off the boat and let everybody else die. You had prisoners on that boat who were just the dregs of society. And every one of them, Paul says, God, I want every life on this ship. And and, and I love it because right there what it says is, and God has given that word means to grant in response to a request. So in other words, Paul said, God, I want every life on this ship. And and God said, I like that, Paul. Here they are. Every man on this boat will live. Listen, that's powerful praying. That is big praying. It's bold. You know, sometimes praying is bold because of how specific it is. Sometimes God will just stir your heart. He'll give you an insight to pray, things you, just ne- you never dreamed of. I may have shared this story, but a number of years ago, we, uh, we had our trailer stolen. And uh, if you can imagine that, our, my father-in-law called the house, and it was parked at a convenience store. And he said to my wife, honey, where's your trailer? She said, it's parked in the truck area at that store. And he said, well, I'm at the store. It's not here. And uh, we thought, well, he just doesn't see it. There's some other trucks there. We drove up there. Our trailer was gone. Somebody had hooked it up driven away with it. Now, don't think in terms of somebody stealing your vacation trailer. Think in terms of somebody backing up to your house, hooking up your house, and driving away with it. Because in one moment, we lost everything. And and my my in-laws were up there, my sister-in-law, they were already in tears, and and the police detective showed up, and as God would have it, he was a believer. He said, Mr. Bearden, I've just got to be honest with you. If we find your trailer, it's probably going to be gutted and stripped. And, you know, in those big moments, in those crisis moments, sometimes, you, you know, I don't always respond the right way, but I just gathered the family around, and I said, Lord, this is your trailer. Everything in it belongs to you. And I said, Lord, we are not going to go through this kicking and screaming. Thank you. I don't understand it. And then, Lord, I want to pray for whoever took it. I pray that somehow through this you would break into their life. Now, my wife jumped in with a prayer And I have to be honest with you, I don't think I joined her (laughs) because she said, and Lord, would you so convict whoever took it that he brings it back? Now, I used to be a thief, and thieves don't bring things back. 
And so I, I don't know, I probably just humored her on that. But, you know, interestingly, the police officer overhearing all this went home. He called all his Sunday school members. They began to pray that same prayer. We found out later that numbers of Sunday school classes in our church there in Lawton, Oklahoma, had begun to pray that same prayer. Four in the morning, I get a call from the police dispatcher. She said, Mr. Bearden, we've located your trailer. I said, okay, where is it? She gave me the address. I said, are you sure? I said, that's where it was stolen from. She said, yes, that's where it is. I drove up there at 4.30 in the morning, police cars everywhere. They're putting a guy in the back seat to take him to jail. And 4.30 in the morning is under such conviction, he's trying to bring it back. You know, sometimes those desperate, God, it, 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 it's, it's a boldness and it's a specific praying that lays hold of God. And you know what? Sometimes it's a big praying. L l let me say something. I, I believe the more mature you get spiritually, the less you will find yourselves constantly praying about your own crisis in life and burdened about the crisis of the needs of others. You will find your heart breaking for nations, for families for marriages. And that crisis will grab your heart. And, and it's like John Knox, give me Scotland or I die. It's Rufus Burleson on a beach in Galveston, Texas, praying, oh God, give me Texas or I die. And God will grab your heart and, and you'll begin to pray big and ask God to do big things. And let me say two final things about crisis. And it's first this, is you will never shine brighter than when you walk with Jesus in the middle of a crisis. You know what's interesting? In the verse 11, right around there of Acts 27, when they're deciding to set sail, Paul puts his opinion in. He says, I don't think this is a good idea. And the centurion just totally ignores him. He said, I don't, I don't, that's nice to hear, but I'm going with these guys. By the end of this chapter, when the soldiers are about to kill all the prisoners so they don't escape, the centurion intervenes to save Paul's life. You know why? Because in the midst of a storm, there was a man who was walking with God and who was hearing from God. And it had a profound impact on that centurion. By the way, that's how John Wesley got saved eventually was watching and listening to the Moravians at peace in the middle of a storm on a ship when he was terrified. And here is Paul, and listen, you shine brightest in the trials and in the crisis of life when you seek the heart of God and, and your heart's breaking or your body's breaking or the pressure's incredible or the, the burden's so, so intense. And you see, our instinct is, God, take it away, take it away. And listen, God says, no, I put it here so that you will cry out to me. You will pray desperately. You will lay hold of me and say, God, I've got nowhere else to go. You know, I know I keep using this quote by Vance Havner, but it's because it has been so fresh on my heart in the last weeks. Shipwrecked on God, stranded on omnipotence. I have landed on God, and I have nowhere else to turn but his power. You will shine brightest in the midst of crisis. And then secondly, God will show his power and you will experience his power in the greatest way in the midst of crisis. You know, we say, God, I want to see your power. But then God says, okay, then here's a situation where you need it. <laughs> We're like, whoa, nah. I don't want the situation, I just want the power. But God gives us a situation, a, a suffering, a trial, and says, here it is. Now, you got nothing left but me. And God demonstrates his power. He works in power because he's put us in a desperate position. Listen, what Vance Havner again called the, the lost beatitude, John the Baptist said, blessed, or Jesus said, re referring to those who, uh, from John the Baptist who said, are you the one or should we wait for another? And Jesus said, you go back and tell him I'm right on time, I'm right on course. And then he said, and blessed are the unoffended. In other words, blessed are those who don't get upset over how I conduct my business. And I think tonight some of us are in the middle of crisis 
and we've complained and we've questioned and you're saying, God, take it away, take it away. And what God wants us to do is embrace it so that we may shine as a light to the world and that his glory may be revealed. You know, I I love this. When King David stood before Goliath, and and I just, it's one of my favorite passages in Scripture. He he says, "I, I do not come with the power of a sword or a spear. I come in the name of the Lord. And I like what David says, and by the way, I'm going to defeat you, and I'm going to take your head off. (laughs) But he says, for this reason, that the world may know that there is a God in Israel and that the assembly that Israel may know that God does not deliver by sword or spear. God does it by his power. So in other words, I mean, that's what we're praying for in revival. When revival comes, the world knows that there is a God and the church finally realizes it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. The crisis you're in right now may actually be the very avenue that God wants to glorify his name in your family, in this church, in this community. And rather than fighting it, you may need to submit to it and simply say, God, be glorified. That the world may know, that the church may see that it is by your power. Let me ask if you would stand with me. If you would bow your heads. We're going to be moving on in the service here, but that's what I want you to do during this time of prayer. I don't, you may not be in a crisis right now. If you're not, you will be. But I know for some of you here tonight, you've been fighting and wrestling And you need to just submit it to God. Throw yourself as a pauper, a beggar before the Lord and just say, God, I'm shipwrecked on you. I'm stranded on your omnipotence. I have no hope but you. I lay hold of you. God, if you don't, it won't happen. That's desperate praying. So whatever you need to do, we're going to take just a few moments to pray. Folks are already coming. If you need to come and just submit to the hand of God. God, I've been offended. I I don't like the way things have been going. But God, tonight, I embrace it. Glorify your name in my life. We'll wait just whatever you need to do. If you want to kneel there in your seat, if you want to come forward, there's plenty of room. You just come and deal with God.